Now the question is, does love, the most treasured of all human sentiments, fall under the scrutiny of Nietzsche's moral psychology? The answer is, of course it does. In fact, Nietzsche says some fairly nasty things about the Christian concept of love, as he does about the Christian concept of compassion. He says of both of them that they are often so much hypocrisy. But it would be a serious mistake to think that Nietzsche condemns love as such. And in fact, although he doesn't focus on it in any concentrated way, as he does some of his themes, one might say that love pervades all of Nietzsche's work, not only the love of life, but the love of other people. And in this lecture, I'd like to try and understand what that is. First, an ad hominem point, and that is that Nietzsche's own love life, of course, was famously barren. He had one celebrated love relationship, one would hardly call it an affair, with Lou Salome. But apart from that, and a couple other encounters equally disastrous, he didn't have what most of us would consider a love life. And yet Nietzsche was very keenly aware of what love was and what it meant and what it signified in the Western world. But in the Western world, there's an important distinction between love as was practiced by, say, the ancient Greeks, pagan love, and love as it is uh, fomented by Christianity. The first is often referred to as eros. Eros, from which we get the word erotic, was a distinctively sexual love. It was not all that well distinguished from non-sexual friendship, for which there was a different word, philia, but it was very clearly distinguished from what would become the key notion of Christian love, namely in Greek agape or in Latin caritas, and the idea was that Christian love, unlike pagan love, had not a tint of sexuality about it. This is something that Nietzsche is going to deny. He is going to say, in effect, that all of love, in fact, all of spirituality, is pervaded by sexuality, even at its highest reaches. The history of Eros and Agape in the ancient world is itself quite fascinating. Originally, as I say, the terms were, I suppose you could say, complementary. Eros did have a very distinctive sexual tint, in fact, Sometimes it was even translated simply as sexual desire. Agape had much more of a sense of humanitarianism. It was the love of a person in a more general, generous sense. But as the history goes on, starting with Plato and certainly through the early years of Christianity with St. Paul in particular, Eros gets vulgarized. It really becomes nothing but sexual desire. In fact, it becomes a kind of selfish grasping Agape, by contrast, is increasingly spiritualized, etherealized, and turned into something that not only has nothing to do with sex, but also something that is pure generosity, pure love. And ultimately, in the Christian tradition, it often tends to become a love which is so pure that only God could actually feel it. With Greek love, the distinction between eros and philia is fascinating because, for one thing, as I say, the distinction wasn't all that sharp. On the other hand, with Eros, there was a whole mythology, a whole set of social sanctions, a whole structure to the way this emotion was felt, practiced, and talked about, partly in semi-theological terms. Eros was a minor god, um, often depicted in Roman uh, painting, for example, or neoclassical painting as a cupid, but Eros was a, a figure of some domesticity. And, for example, there were two Eros, uh, Eroses in uh, Greek talk. Uh, there was an Eros sort of of marriage and the family, and then there was an Eros of what we today, but not the Greeks, would call romantic love. And that's what Plato, in particular, in his great book on love, perhaps the greatest ever written, called The Symposium, talks about in some detail. Philia, by contrast, was the focus of Aristotle's treatise in the Ethics. In fact, the discussion of friendship uh, takes up the longest single, uh, longest single strain of that book, something that should make us think today. Uh, books on ethics very often ignore the notion of friendship altogether. 
for the Greeks and then for the Romans, it very clearly was the central feature of ethics and something to be taken very, very seriously. Nietzsche celebrates Eros. In fact, he thinks that all of philosophy has its erotic touch. And in this, he goes back to Plato, or to Socrates in the Symposium, for whom Eros is quite clearly a kind of longing, a kind of grasping, a kind of need for something much higher and other than oneself. Ultimately, for Plato and Socrates, it's going to be for the truth and for beauty itself. But for Nietzsche, too, that love has to be considered as something very spiritual, something kind of reaching out, something a longing for something far beyond oneself. In fact, in one of his uh, essays, Nietzsche writes that the spiritualization of sensuality is one of the great accomplishments in love. And in this, it far surpasses Christian notions of love. He's always going to be playing these off one against the other. But since he often just talks about love, it's sometimes difficult to tell whether he's going to be talking about the particular Christian notion or about this more pagan notion which he wants to defend. Now one of the things that Plato does, and this is largely through the mouth of Socrates, is he starts to desexualize love. Now with Eros, of course, this was a real linguistic jar for the Greeks because as I said, Eros is often translated as something very much like sexual desire. So if you think about non-sexual sexuality, you're faced with something approaching a contradiction. But when Socrates presents his view of love in the symposium, that's very clearly part of what he has in mind. On the other hand, friendship is considered the highest form of love, not so, ha so much for Socrates and Plato, but certainly for Aristotle. And here Nietzsche wants to join in too, because the idea of friendship as something which epitomizes human relationships is something that even though he had only a few friends and rather strained and desperate relationships with them, Nietzsche fully appreciated. In fact, one of his, I think, most wise comments about marriage, an institution which he never enjoyed himself, was basically that one should think about marriage as a long conversation in other words, as an extended, lifelong friendship. And I think, just from practical experience, most of us can say, yeah, that's right. That if we're going to think about love, that should be a key ingredient. Christian love, by contrast, doesn't emphasize friendship, although sometimes it emphasizes a more abstract notion of brotherhood. And the worst thing about Christian love for Nietzsche is the fact that it pretends to be completely desexualized. Even philia for the Greeks clearly had a kind of warm bodily component, even if not sexual. But Christian love, of course, is ultimately the love of pure souls. And that Nietzsche utterly rejects. In the symposium, Plato gives us a number of views about love. That certainly would be worth an entire lecture by itself. But for my purposes here, I'd just like to summarize two of those. One of the views is given by the playwright Aristophanes, who is depicted in the play, in the dialogue, as the comic author that he was, but also with a touch of tragedy. Um, there's a sense, though, in which Plato is sort of getting even with Aristophanes, who had made fun of Socrates in an earlier play called The Clouds, and he sort of puts in his mouth not only a silly story, but at the end of that he gives him the hiccups to make him sort of the comic butt of the symposium as well. But the Aristophanes story, which can be briefly told, something that most of you have heard, whether or not you know the origin, goes something like this. That in prehistoric times, human beings were more perfect beings than they are now. They were much bigger, first of all. They were perfectly shaped, which for the Greek meant they were spherical. They had twice the number of arms, twice the number of legs. They had two heads, so they were twice as smart. And consequently, they had a whole lot of what the Greeks called hubris, arrogance and offended the gods. Zeus, in retaliation, split them all in two, making them, for the rest of their lives, run around looking for their other half. Aristophanes' story, I think, is very profound, even though it, on the surface, is quite silly. The idea is that it is love that completes us, makes us whole. And as for this notion of reunification, it's a good explanation about why sexual desire is so powerful in us. 
It's not just a desire for a brief biological contact. It's not just, as Schopenhauer said, the urge of the species to reproduce itself. But rather, our desire for another person is nothing less than the metaphysical desire to complete ourselves as human beings. Nietzsche rejects this. And he rejects it for, I think, a fairly good reason. The idea of merging, of fusion, the idea of not being a complete person in yourself but only with another person is something which is often criticized these days, in particular by women and feminists, by the submerging of one person into the identity of the other. And even if you have a more egalitarian view of the matter, nevertheless there's a sense in which this view of love robs a person of his or her individual identity. And of course for a strong individualist like Nietzsche, that individual identity is all important. So Nietzsche rejects the Aristophanes story and says rather that people must be independent in their love. I think, in fact, the picture that one might give as an alternative to this story is one that is depicted by D.H. Lawrence in his novel Women in Love. And Lawrence, of course, had read Nietzsche and I think was greatly influenced by him. But Lawrence has an image of two people in love being like what he calls pole stars, two stars which have their independent existence and nevertheless are tied together forever by the forces of gravity, etc. And for Nietzsche, you might say, that's the ideal. It's not as if love isn't important, even essential, but your independent identity has to come first. Second contrast is with Socrates. And Socrates, as usual in Plato's dialogues, is the main speaker. Socrates has a rather lengthy account of love, but its highlight is basically this. When we're young and immature and we fall in love for the first time, what strikes us is the, is the beauty of another person. And in particular, to be honest, it's the beauty of another person's body. As we get more mature, we learn that it's not just the beauty of another person's body that we love, but what we really desire is their beauty as a person as body and soul. But even so, this is still immature. And when we go through life and go through multiple love relationships or crushes, what we start to appreciate if we have some philosophical wisdom is the fact that it is not just this or that particular person with his or her beauty that attracts us, but it is beauty itself. And so the upshot of Socrates' discussion is that when you fall in love, what you really long for is the form of beauty as such. And so, the ideal lover, he concludes, is the philosopher. This is rather self-serving, but the idea is that Socrates, as the philosopher, is also a lover. And of course, the Pythagorean for formula that gives the word its meaning, philosophy, the love of wisdom is precisely what Aristotle is, what, what Plato is talking about here, and the love has to be considered a form of erotic love. The third, uh, sorry, Nietzsche rejects that uh, for some fairly obvious reasons, because what Socrates sets up here is a kind of etherealization of love, a removal of love from a relationship between two concrete flesh and blood people to something much more abstract, much more distant, and it's only a short step, as Nietzsche often points out, between this Platonic view of love and the, and the Christian view of God. Because one might say that just as in Socrates, one loves another person only by way of an intermediary to get to beauty itself and the good, so too in Christianity, one loves another person only as a kind of intermediary to get to God. In the Middle Ages, this gets a name, and it's not too surprisingly, it's called platonic love, where platonic love does not just mean friendship without sex, as we rather vulgarly use the term today, but it meant something much more profound. That platonic love was the idea that one loves another person as a way of loving God. Nietzsche, again, clearly rejects that. He rejects any such notion of the otherworldly. He rejects this, what he would consider, phony notion of spiritualization. 
He rejects the idea that what we love is not another person, but rather an abstraction. The third character dimensioned here, who did, was, who did not play a part in the symposium, but nevertheless, I think, is very an important figure, if only by way of perversity in the history of love, is the Marquis de Sade. We don't usually think of Sade as a philosopher. Uh, we think of him only as a pornographer. The truth is that he had written a good deal of philosophy, and he had read a good deal of philosophy, and he was very much a follower of the Swiss-French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau. The idea of living naturally, the idea of paying attention to our natural sentiments, the idea of seeing society as, in some sense, a collection of individuals, but individuals who are often defined in terms of their eccentricity, as Jean-Jacques himself certainly defined himself. That all comes straight from Rousseau. And Saad saw sex in a very special role. Now, of course, the word sadism comes from his name, and sadism played a very large role in some of his writings. But to put it in not too gruesome terms, the way Saad viewed sex, and love, of course, is simply a kind of nice word for sex, the way Saad viewed sex was basically as perversion. That sex was a kind of expression of power. And here, the two would seem to uh, be fairly closely akin. Because Nietzsche, after all, wants to say power is at the basis of whole, all human relationships. Saad wants to say that power is at the basis of sexual relationships. And so I think there's a very real danger to think of Nietzsche in terms of sadism, in terms of the marquee. Uh, there is a photograph that Kathy will be talking about in which Nietzsche is depicted, or rather depicts himself, in a little cart uh, carrying a whip with Lou Salome. Um, this was very tongue-in-cheek, but nevertheless, it gives an image which, of course, lends itself to this particular connection. So I want to say very firmly that Nietzsche would have nothing to do with this. That, first of all, when Nietzsche talks about sex, he is not talking about arousal and sexual excitement, much less the kind of sexual behavior and often straight cruelty that Saad often advocated. More importantly, when he talks about sex and power together, he's not talking about anything like power over another person. He's talking about something very different. Sexuality for him is eros. It's erotic. It's something that drives us from our very roots. It is not something which is essentially a social act. And power, as we'll see later on, is not simply the exercise of raw control over another person, but power is something more personal. It has to do with strength, it has to do with self-discipline, it has to do with self-confidence. So I just want to make it very clear that even though we're going to be talking about Nietzsche and sex and power together, I want to get rid of the idea that here he's really just a rather... Um, innocent and abstemious version of the Marquis de Sade. What is love for Nietzsche? If it isn't Christian love and it's not ethereal, what is the sense in which two people should and can be in love? I think the best way to approach this is to move to Aristotle. And I'm going to do a little trick here and say what we're going to be talking about is Aristotle's concept of philia or friendship but with Plato or Socrates' notion of the erotic built into it. And I want to go back to that idea that marriage should be thought of as a long conversation. And back to the idea that the ideal of love is, first of all, friendship. Because Aristotle talks about friendship in at least three different ways. And as I said, it's the longest single discussion in his great book on ethics. First, he talks about friendship in terms of using people. And we all do this more than we think we do. For example, if I become friendly with you in class because you take spectacularly good notes and I don't, and in return I buy you lunch every other week, and not surprisingly the friendship ends as the semester ends, you might say that it's not really a friendship at all 
We're just using each other. I'm using you for your notes. You're using me for an occasional free lunch. It can be more subtle and less obviously manipulative than that. For example, I enjoy playing squash, but of course, I can't play squash alone. So I befriend you. You love squash too. And so every Wednesday, we meet on the squash court, and we have ourselves a good time playing squash. I couldn't do it without you. You couldn't do it without me. There's a sense in which we're using each other. We might very well, especially in this society, describe ourselves as friends. But the truth is, again, we're simply using one another. It is not a true friendship at all. Even more subtly, there's a sense in which we use each other in a very psychological way. And here is one of those places where, for Nietzsche, the motivation has to be forgotten, has to be somehow buried, because we don't want to admit that this is what we're doing. But if you look at how people choose their friends, they typically will choose people who are like them. Or, if not like them, they will choose people who complement them. And in fact, the word complement there is sort of a pun, or it's ambiguous, because on the one hand, it's complement in the sense of fit with, even if someone's an opposite, sort of mutton Jeff. Nevertheless, the fit together is quite right. But it's also a complement in the other sense, that people who are our friends are people who tend to complement us, people who tend to approve of us, people who tend to laugh at our jokes, people who are not too critical. Now, of course, if you're a rather agonistic person and you love to argue, then your friends will also be people who love to argue. But they won't people be people who criticize you for being so argumentative. That's not the idea. What you want is friends who like to argue because you're using them in the same way you use a squash partner. And basically, it's still a notion of using each other, using each other for approval, using each other for carrying out activities that require a twosome. In general, what we're talking about is something which Aristotle says is only barely a friendship and probably not that at all. Nietzsche says, an awful lot of contemporary friendships are nothing but this. And of course, with the addition of Christianity and the idea of Christian fellowship, it takes on an increasingly complicated form of hypocrisy. That we are friends with people sometimes because that's what we're supposed to do to get into the kingdom of heaven. Or we're friends with people because they are allies in the fight against non-believers or other sects. But it is not a friendship that is based on anything but mutual utility. The second kind of friendship that Aristotle talks about, which is certainly much higher on his scale, is the friendship of mutual enjoyment. Now, I use the squash, the squash example as a way of illustrating mutual using. But of course, it might be more than that. You might also particularly enjoy this person and his or her behavior, the way they uh, talk with you, the conversations you can have. Or if you're in an argumentative relationship, you might really enjoy the argument. And it's not just needing another person to argue with, but it's just the two of you have a particularly good time together. Or it might just be, this is a person you enjoy being with. Or this is a person you enjoy doing things with. In any case, it's a friendship based on mutual enjoyment, which is very different from talking about mutual using or mutual advantage. If you are friends with somebody because you enjoy them, that's certainly something which is not at all blameworthy. We all do it. In fact, Nietzsche would have been better off if he had a bit more of that. But the idea is that this is a better form of friendship, but it still isn't what friendship is really all about. What friendship is really all about is mutual inspiration. Now, to go back to a sports analogy, if you think about playing squash or tennis with someone, everyone knows that the way you improve yourself is by playing with somebody who is better than you are. There are folks, of course, who pick opponents who they're sure of beating, but first of all, we consider that a rather pathetic performance, only playing people you know you can beat. But secondly, and perhaps more importantly, you don't get any better. In fact, there's a good chance that you're going to get worse. You play with somebody better, and you become a better player. Well, so it is in life more generally. If you admire your friend, if you really think that your friend's virtues are worth emulating, 
then you yourself are going to become a better person in that relationship. Or, going back to one of the early speakers in Plato's Symposium, if you are thinking of your friend in terms of love, then one of the things that comes along with that is wanting to be a better person for him or for her. So when you're in love, one of your impulses, and a very important creative impulse, is wanting to improve yourself, wanting to be a better person, wanting this other person to think better of you, and wanting to be more deserving of his or her love. Now for Aristotle, this is the key to friendship. And I think in Socrates, although Socrates himself talks about this very ethereal notion of falling in love with the forms and so on. In Socrates' own behavior, it becomes very clear that this is the idea too, that friendship is mutual inspiration. You aren't friends with someone just because you have an advantage, because you can use them. You're not friends just because you enjoy someone, although enjoyment often follows. You are friends with someone because you mutually inspire each other. And this is what Nietzsche is all about too. Love for Nietzsche is this kind of mutual inspiration. What's invigorating and sort of wonderful about his relationship with Lou, however awkwardly it may have ended, was that it is very clear that the two of them really inspired one another. That it was mutual in that sense, that while she certainly admired his ability and talked at great length and with some wit about Nietzsche's skills and temperament, Nietzsche clearly felt the same thing in return, that this was a remarkable woman, a remarkable intellect, a remarkable companion. And I think the critical years in which they spent together, 1882 in particular, was a very formative year for Nietzsche in terms of his mature philosophy. Now all of this has to be put in the context of one of the more immediate of Nietzsche's influences. He knew the classics very well, of course, but the book that was always on his mind was Schopenhauer's World as Will and Idea. And in that book, as Kathy has described in some detail, this notion of the will going through us is the dominant image. And as I explained in an earlier lecture, one manifestation of this is sexuality and our sex drive. It's a question somewhat mysterious. Why do we want sex so much? Why is it so important to us? And you can have a straightforward biological answer, you can have a hormonal answer, you can have an answer in terms of the culture and advertising and all of that, and I think all of this plays an important role. But Schopenhauer wants to say it is something much more powerful than that. What drives sex in us, what makes sex so important, is the fact that it is nothing less than the will to life within us. It is the will of the species to reproduce itself. And the reason why we have sexual desire, even in some twisted sense perverted sexual desire, is because we have this desire which we may not even know that we are exercising, this desire for the continuation of the species. Now, for Schopenhauer, the advice we get is rather mixed. Schopenhauer himself actually was a ladies' man, he did not abstain from this particular desire and the satisfactions and suffering that came along with it. Nietzsche, on the other hand, probably did. And one way to think about the difference between the two is that first, Nietzsche saw Schopenhauer's depiction as fairly vulgar. That what we need to talk about is sexuality in terms of its sublimation and the different forms that it can take. And it's here that he says, that erotic, eroticism, permeates virtually everything we do, we think, we feel. Even, he says, to the highest reaches of our spirituality. Religion is not something free from sexuality, but it's not raw sex. And here you might contrast the sort of original Dionysian orgies with the kind of ethereal Dionysus that Nietzsche celebrates. But the idea is that sex and the erotic is something which is sublimated to produce some of our greatest works. Which leads me back to the question of the passions. Notice here that what Nietzsche is saying is that a passion, the passion of love, properly construed, 
is one of the most important things in life. And in a future lecture, I want to talk in more detail about the way in which Nietzsche ultimately wants to say that this kind of depth psychology is going to focus on the nature of the passions and the way in which passions give meaning to life.